surprised just like everyone else. Hey, everybody. Uh, so uh, you're in for a treat today. And I could not do this justice because nobody can impersonate Robin Williams better than Robin Williams. So we're going to start this webinar with a uh, kind of a topical welcome. Good morning, Vietnam! Hey, just... <laughs> it feels like we're in a bit of a war. <laughs> so we've got extremes and I've got friends on both sides of this, uh, you know, football where, you know, if you don't get the jab, you are equal to Hitler and you're killing Mabel, my grandmother. And on the other extreme is if you show up at my door and ask if I got the jab, you're going to be meted with uh, my Smith and Wesson. So uh, those are the two extremes. And the crazy thing is I'm allergic. I can't even get the shot. So, um, hey, come on, man. You know, I think the reality is, is we probably have people, I hope not in both extremes, but there's probably somewhere in that divide on both sides that care passion and are passionate about it. But like, what do we do as business owners? So I think that's where we're going to go. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, activity just on LinkedIn, probably double what we normally have, uh, just because it's a hot topic. Uh, so uh, I know Adam probably has a bit of a additional color to add on that. And Jack has been doing his due diligence as an attorney should. And he's got friends in high places in their law firm that have good answers for like, what do we, what do you do as a, as an employer in the middle of this kind of uncharted territory? So Jack's going to go deep. Um, Adam is, is queued up. Um, just as a reminder to folks, hit us up with the Q&A with questions. You can harass us on the chat. Try to keep it from being uh, extremely political. Uh, what we're trying to do is just navigate through this and show respect to one another. Okay, so <laughs> that's why I'm wearing the culture t-shirt today. Thank you, Movement Mortgage. So go ahead, Adam. Yeah, so I didn't have a whole lot um, this week other than the, um, the with the infrastructure bipartisan deal that looks like it's going to make it all the way through is just reminding everybody on the call that there aren't any tax real changes that are in that. Um, the tax stuff related to that infrastructure proposal is the, uh, <clears throat> you know, just stepping up the enforcement to enforce the laws that we already have on the books for the IRS, uh, which is really going to be, you know, likely going to be targeted at under reporting issues, which just, you know, for all intents and purposes, it just means, you know, more audit professionals likely in the field. Um, on the broader infrastructure package that they were, you know, talking about doing through reconciliation, you know, this is just a reminder that, you know, A, reconciliation can only occur once per year, so you only have one shot at it. Um, B, uh, you know, Kristen Cinema already came out and said, I'm not for this <laughs> in its existing capacity. So, you know, the, the fear mongers that are out and the doomsayers that are out there saying, oh, your tax rates are going up in 2021, will be retroactive. That's looking less and less likely as a scenario um, for us. But what I did want to keep everybody's eye on the ball on is that you know part of you know part of the American Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was an expiration of several several of the favorable tax benefits that we're enjoying today, primarily around the rates, <laughs> the Qualified business income deduction, which really hits S corps and partnerships and reduces the amount of taxable income that you have, and then the estate tax uh, limitation. Um, so all that stuff goes away in 2026, and there's not a whole lot of talk about from Republicans doing anything about that. I know that's still 2026. That's presidential election and several congressional cycles away. And at the same time, the whole reason that had to exist in the first place was because of a Republican issued 
um, amendment a long time ago that basically said, look, this stuff needs to pay for itself and it can't be all based on um, projected economic growth. So I just, you know, I just think everybody just again needs to be, you know, really aware that, you know, what we're enjoying today um, probably will not last. Um, and in order of pain, you know, even though it's far out, estate tax is probably the bigger pain for the majority of our clients. And then, you know, the rates. Uh, so while we have probably reprieve in 2021, don't know what's going to happen in 22, just a reminder to everybody that, look, there, there was a clock and that clock is 2026. So, you know, if we get a break until 2026, it's great, but it's probably likely that this all goes away in 2026 um, anyway. So let's just count our blessings up until then. So, uh, and that's not political, that's as, you know, Adam Bozeman, business owner, likes paying a lower tax rate, period. <laughs> so anyway, that's all I got for my tirade this morning, Gary. What? Yeah. Come on, man. I'm, you I'm you a, need I'm to a, drink some more coffee. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a listener for the purposes of Jack. It's like, look, I'm trying to learn from this stuff too. <laughs> so. Yeah, I hear you. All right, good. Um, also, just while, you know, while we're talking about some of the stuff you've been talking about, I think um, if you are a client of ours, you're going to be getting some more information about ERTC next week. So stay tuned on that. Um, and we've got kind of a defined process. We're going to start with people that look like it's highly likely that you're going to um, have uh, and qualify. And then we will move into the maybe, maybe, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> but we're going to start with the highly likely. So stay tuned on that. And um, so, Jack, unmute and rock and roll, man. All right. So the way once once we had discussed and decided on the topic, I reached out to two of my partners who we've grown up together as baby partners and you know a couple of decades later who we are uh one of them is in toledo in our toledo office one is in here in this office and so um as expected they hit me with a plethora of information that um could if i were able and willing to read through all of it might make me a subject matter expert in all of this stuff so right now though i am a subject subject matter expert observer uh, and uh, feeling very fortunate and blessed to have um, that expertise within the firm. So my request to them was, hey, you guys know I've been doing this stuff for, uh, you know, 70 weeks plus now or so. And um, I need some. but who's cap? Yes, right. Um, and so, you know, this is one of those, hey, can you provide Jack some information so he doesn't look like an idiot on live television uh, webinar? So um, they came through for me. So uh, the, the request was, hey, can you provide me some information with respect to you know, what employers are doing, what the risks are with respect to face masks, and, but more so for vaccinations, mandatory, voluntary, providing it. Uh, and, and there's just so many, I mean, we could spend hours, days talking about this stuff and not get through all of it because there's the interaction of the FMLA, of the EEOC, of all of these organizations and, and uh, rules that interact with each other, but in some cases have different standards with respect to, for example, what is a reasonable accommodation, those kind of things. So I'm gonna start out with a little story, a uh, recent story out of Texas, the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas. And so the story goes like this. On April 1st, Houston Methodist Hospital announced a policy requiring employees to be vaccinated against COVID-19 by June 7th, 2021. 117 employees sued to block the injection requirement. Um, oh, and if you don't get it, you are terminated. Uh, kind of a key point, right? Um, she, the, the, main, the main plaintiff argued that if she's fired for refusing to be injected with a vaccine, she'll be wrongfully terminated. Now, this is one thing this particular Texas law. So this is really a state law issue, but so um, but it's a federal court case, which sometimes is instructive. They just had the opportunity to hear this situation first. So Texas law protects employees from being terminated for refusing to commit an act carrying criminal penalties to the worker. So in other words, you're forcing somebody to do something criminal. And if they don't, they get terminated. 
So she has to show that she was required to commit an illegal act. She refused to engage in illegality and she was discharged because of her refusal. And that was the only reason for her refusal. Um, in the complaint, she says that she refuses to be a human guinea pig but the court said that receiving the vaccination is not an illegal act and carries no criminal penalties or refusing to accept the inoculation will, um, that in the hospital's judgment will make it safer for the workers and the, and the patients in the hospital's care, okay? Then she got into some public policy questions and issues. Um, and she says that no one can be mandated to receive unapproved medicines in emergencies. And she cites to the federal law, which allowed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to introduce into interstate commerce the um, products intended for use in an emergency. Um, and really the mandate says that the, if you look at it carefully that all what that is is it's allowing the introduction of interstate commerce, but it also allows you to accept or not accept uh, the administration of the product. But the court held that it, this doesn't apply to private employers like this hospital. Um, and so that claim failed. She also argued that the injection violates federal law uh, against um, human, experimenting against human subjects. She said that the injection requirement is forcing employees to participate in human trials because no currently available vaccine has been fully approved by the FDA which is an interesting point. And I think that that is um, kind of glossed over a little bit here and other places that, you know, there is a difference between these vaccines are not fully approved. They've been, they're allowed to be used in an emergency situation. But if, if you look, my understanding is you will not find that they have been approved by the FDA. And so that's why people are saying, well, you know, we trust the FDA to, to, for our well being and trust them to make right decisions for us because they're uh, charged with making sure that what we put in our bodies and eat and everything else is, is okay. Um, and so she says that, uh, and if you fire me for not taking the injection, then you're basically allowing us to be human subjects. And so the court said that the hospital employees are not participants in the human trial. They are licensed doctors, nurses, medical technicians, and staff. Um, and so that claim fails. Um, what was really telling, and I think that, you know, if, if for nothing else, they threw this case out just because of stupidity, uh, was that, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Nuremberg Code. I was, uh, I had heard of it through studying, you know, in school in younger years, but we had the opportunity to go to tag along with my wife on a business trip to Berlin and see firsthand the remnants of a concentration camp, camp go to the Berlin Wall. So her accusation or her allegation was that the requirement to get this injection violates the Nuremberg Code and, and she likens the threat of termination to the forced medical experimentation during the Holocaust. Um, and, and the court did what they should do, which is what is the legal argument and justification, yes or no. And they said, well, you know, Methodist is the hospital, the private employer, not a government um, uh, requiring the, these injections. And then they made the statement that they should have made, which was equating the injection requirement to medical experimentation in concentration camps is reprehensible. Nazi doctors conducted medical experiments on victims that caused pain, mutilation, permanent disability, in many cases, death. Um, and then in concluding, they said what you would think is after hearing all that, which is um, she's not being coerced. They're doing their business of saving lives without giving people COVID-19, hopefully. Um, it's a choice to keep staff and their patients safe. Bridges can freely choose, and that's her name. Uh, she can freely choose to accept or refuse the vaccine. However, if she refused, she will simply need to work somewhere else. And that, you know, they, and we'll talk about this, about reasonable accommodations in a moment, but it, what you don't see is, is that she was um, provided a different assignment where she wouldn't be exposed, different office, earlier start time. Um, but if they don't accept that, then they can be properly fired. 
And the most important, the, the point to take away from this is every employment includes limits on the worker's behavior in exchange for remuneration. That is all part of the bargain. So, you know, when we talk about reasonable accommodations and about, uh, you know, what we're going to talk about next is that there are limitations. This isn't like, okay, well, uh, there's a problem, whether it is uh, disability or other is religion is, is the other the main thing that you only have to go so far as an employer to accommodate that. So um, let's get into that, which is masks and vaccinations, right? And so the issue is, is that it's discrimination is the issue, whether it is or not. And the right now the focus is on two, two issues, which is religious based objections and discrimination based on health, prior health um, issues. And so um, th that's the focus. And what you have, and if you need something to put you to sleep at night, there are 23 pages of small print of the US Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, to um, that address. It's kind of a Q&A, but it's a Q&A that was developed by people asking questions over the course of time and them responding to them. And in some cases they had an open forum where they responded back to them. So I'm pulling from a couple of those that, that my partners, uh, Derek Thurman and Michelle Zaru had suggested that, you know, is, is kind of good talking points. They've done presentations on this stuff. And so the stuff that they gave me is very thick. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of get to the highlights of it, which is, okay, so, an employer re requires COVID-19 vaccinations on employees. Um, how should an employee who doesn't get the vaccine because of disability inform the employer and what should the employer do? So the situation is, is that you decided that, um, and we'll talk about whether you should decide to do that or not, but you've decided that the, uh, you want your employees to get it. So what, what is the responsibility once you make that decision? And according to the, the, these responses, managers and supervisors responsible for communicating are responsible for communicating with employees about compliance with the policy, but they also should know how to recognize an accommodation request from an employee with a disability and know who to refer to. Um, at at, as a best practice before instituting mandatory vaccination policy, employers should provide managers and others responsible for implementing policy training, and clear information on how to handle this. The worst case scenario is that you do something, but you don't have the infrastructure to be able to deal with that. And a lot of it is, how do you react? Um, maybe stating the obvious is you can't say, well, you know, hey, in, in the lunchroom, did you hear about, you know, this person and, and they have these issues, or even the fact that they're not vaccinated. If you have information that they're not vaccinated, you can't share that information with others. So. Um, okay, so let's talk briefly about reasonable accommodations. Uh, what does that mean? And under the ADA, that essentially means that um, if it doesn't pose undue hardship, meaning a significant difficulty or expense, um, there are factors that go into that. So let's say that there's 20 employees and 18 of them are vaccinated. So there's only two people that have requested it. What is reasonable to do for them versus if it were 10 people that were not vaccinated? What do you need to do? So there are things that are out of your control, choices made by your employee workforce that may inform what you need to do in certain circumstances. Um, and like I said, for example, it's unlawful for an employer to disclose that an employee is receiving a reasonable accommodation or to retaliate against an employee requesting for an accommodation, right? Um, okay, what I also found interesting in this little summary was that say an employee asks for an accommodation based on religion, religious beliefs. Um, you, you, in most cases, have to roll with it, but I thought it was interesting is if an employer is aware of facts that provide an objectionable basis for questioning either the religious nature or the sincerity of the particular belief, practice, or observance, the employer would be justified in requesting additional supporting information. So 
somebody comes to you with an issue, there are limitations on how far you can dig into those issues. If you don't believe them and you have a reasonable, re reasonable reason to not believe them, you know, they, um, I, I guess the example this came up in a conversation. Um, they were heathens yesterday and all of a sudden now they caught religion and the religion conveniently <laughs> says, um, yeah, I don't think I like, you know, my religion says I'm not supposed to inject that kind of stuff into my body. So I'm supposed to remain pure and I'm not making fun of any religions and I'm not making fun of any of you that may consider yourselves heathens. I'm just saying that that is, um, you know, what, what they're looking for. Okay. And, and as I said, like under title eight, undue hardship is defined differently. And so, you know, again, we could spend a lot of time what that means, but in going down this pathway, in deciding mass, in deciding vaccines, whether or not you're going to provide them, whether or not you're gonna force people to get them. There are, again, different standards that you have to navigate through in order to make sure, and you hopefully end up at the, the common denominator and what is the most restrictive that you're implementing because therefore, you, you know, all the other restrictions are less than that and then you should be okay. All right, so, a couple other things. So let's get to kind of the meat of things. Under federal law, and, and this is an outline, and like I, I've told you guys before, I don't like reading off of things, but I mean, this is such, such a well put together outline that it's just, I may as well just tell you what it says on here rather than me trying to paraphrase it uh, and use synonyms just for the sake of using synonyms. But under federal law, can employers mandate the vaccinations for employees? Things you need to consider are the risk to customers, other workers, and the general public. So is it something you really need to have the vaccination in your shop for those reasons? Um, it could depend on things like what's going on in your community. Um, I, I, I heard in the news this morning that there's one county somewhere in North Carolina that is the only county that's in the red. So if you were an employer in that county, you might say, well, we probably need to do this because of certain circumstances of the people around us. Worker health issues. Okay, now you're requiring somebody to do something to their body. And so what are the repercussions of that? Um, and then also the public necessity of the business. So if it's some, if you're a frontline worker, but other things that, or if um, servers, I heard something that makes total sense this morning on the radio, but hadn't really thought about it every time I go out to eat, that statistically, the younger people, meaning between 18 and 25, there's a lot of unvaccinated people in that age group. And statistically, guess who are the, the individuals who are serving us food when we go out to eat, right? So those are kind of things you need to think about when doing this. So two options, mandatory or voluntary. Um, you know, And then you make it voluntary or mandatory and do you provide someone on site, you call up Walgreens and say, hey, can you guys, you know, like in our building, they have, there's a Walgreens downstairs. Can you guys come up and, you know, bring some, bring some of the sauce to inject into people? And, um, you know, so gray area, uncertain hodgepodge of guidance. So as I said, you have different regulators coming in different directions. Liability to employers for imposing the, the, um, the restrictions uh, you know, basically it comes down to making the best business decision for your business, which only can be made for your business. It isn't a one size fits all. Um, there are cases out there. I mentioned the, the Texas one. There's one in New Mexico that uh, employees of a county detention center are suing to prevent mandatory vaccines and employment action based on refusal. So basically, they're saying the prison guards have to get their shots or else they can't work. Um, high incidences of exposure within that population of, of detainees, just statistically again. And so, you know, what, what are they going to do about that? Then you have to deal with the, uh, the EEOC guidance. And this was back in, in 2020, which has not been overturned by the current administration. But something to consider is that we may know what the rules are now. We think we may know what some of the rules are, but those may change 
as the Biden administration maybe makes some modifications to certain guidance. But at this point, the guidance does not explicitly say that employers can mandate vaccination, but discusses employer duties to accommodate disabilities and sincerely held religious beliefs that they do mandate it. So essentially what we've been talking about. Um, I think that the, the, the belief amongst the legal community, as far as I know, is that in the business community is that employers can require vaccination provided they address these reasonable accommodation requests. If you go through and kind of flow through everything, the law, the regulations, it seems to be that's where you end up, which is that it's permissive. Um, but this, again, a lot of guidance uh, that is maybe conflicting to that. We talked about the, disability, the exceptions for disabilities and religion. Um, okay. So let's go a little bit deeper into, uh, okay, so in a, if an employee has a disability that prevents vaccination, what do you require it to do? Okay, you can have a safety-based qualification standard such as a vaccination requirement. If the safety-based qualification screens out or tends to screen out an individual with a disability, the employer must show that an unvaccinated employee would pose, and this is, okay, so you find someone through this process that you know is unvaccinated. And then you're like, I can't have them around. I, I, oh, they're unvaccinated, they have a disability, you know about it, what do you do? And so according to the EEOC, that the employer must show an unvaccinated employee would pose a direct threat due to a significant risk of substantial harm to the health or safety of the individual or others that cannot be eliminated or reduced by reasonable accommodation. Um, that means that it's on a case by case basis. And they've published a four factor, I don't wanna call it test, four factor consideration. Um, the duration of the risk, the nature and severity of the potential harm, the likelihood that the potential harm will occur and the imminence of the potential harm. And then they say that a direct threat would include a determination that an unvaccinated individual will expose others to the virus at the work site. Okay, so the mere possibility of exposure can be, in certain circumstances, a determination that there is this direct threat. Um, reasonable, so we've been talking about reasonable accommodations. So they also say, well, what might that be? And they give some examples. So allowing the use of an approved mask as an alternative to vaccination, other types of personal protective equipment, such as a face shield, face shield hood, suit, gloves, temporarily assigning job duties that do not require vaccination to perform, for example, in a medical setting. So not direct patient contact, move them to a clerical position, maybe one that doesn't even touch the papers that end up in the patient's hands reassigning the employee to a vacant position or department that does not require vaccination or work from home, which also has a lot of can of worms associated with that. Uh, and um, again, religious beliefs are an issue. I mentioned what you can and can't say under certain circumstances. And so the guidance does mention that, and I wanna share that with all of you that the guidance specifically provides that asking an employee if they have been vaccinated is not a disability related inquiry and is not a violation of the ADA. There's been some questions as to whether or not you can ask someone, are you vaccinated? Um, there are questions and, and I think it comes, I think there is a presumption by most that if you're not wearing a mask, then you're probably vaccinated. And the reverse of that is an assumption, which is if you're wearing a mask, then you have not been vaccinated. And in either case, is it appropriate to ask that question? And the answer according to the EEOC is yes, as an employer, you can ask that question. Now, what you can't ask is if they tell you, no, I'm not vaccinated, you can't ask them, well, why the hell not? You know, um, either, in that tone or not in that tone. It's like, oh, you know, tell me, tell me what's going on. You know, issues at home, why, you know, whatever it is, you can't ask that question. 
because it's basically asking personally protected information. Um, you similarly cannot ask for family history. So what that may lead to is, um, well, we don't want it. We're not getting the vaccine because of this or that, or, um, hey, I'm pregnant. Now you just basically ask a question that you can't ask otherwise, which is, hey, are you pregnant? Um, so things like that. Um, you can't ask family medical history. Um, okay, genetic information. There's a whole uh, slew of laws and regulations with respect to, to asking about genetic information and, and that kind of thing. Um, okay, you can ask for proof of vaccination. You're allowed to do that. Uh, and then, you know, getting into uh, medical leave issues and that kind of thing. Another interesting topic is workers' compensation, right? And we talked about this before is, okay, now you force someone to get a vaccination and they've rolled with it and they get sick. Um, I think many of us have experienced the, the aftermath of being injected with this, which is knocks you out for maybe 24 hours, maybe longer. Um, some people have, uh, you know, <laughs> said that they've gotten uh, sick twice from the vaccination, which I don't know if that's even possible. But what leads me to believe is that they've had, you know, some other illness uh, related, unrelated, right? So maybe they caught the cold, maybe they actually caught the flu, maybe whatever it is, okay? And so that, that becomes the problem is when you have this conjoining of or, or aggregation of getting the shot at the direction of your employer, and then you get sick. What if you didn't get sick because of the vaccine? Well, it seems like the assumption is, well, you probably got sick because of the vaccine. So then workers' comp starts kicking in. So, you know, the side effects or complications of mandatory vaccination um, are likely, and I say likely because I don't think it's been fully adjudicated, are likely a workers' comp issue. And then um, some examples under Ohio law, if it's mandatory, oh, coerced voluntary, another word for that is voluntold. So if you're voluntold to do it, then that may be uh, you know, a workers' compensation issue. In Florida, uh, injury for workers' compensation is defined as personal injury or death by accident arising out of and in the course of employment. So being asked to get an injection or mandatorily ordered to get one seems to fall under that. Um, allergic reactions to vaccine. It's like, okay, you know, there's the causation, but for the fact that you got injected, that you had this reaction, but it could have been, you know, the same reaction that if you got stung by a bee or something else. So, you know, is that something that, you know, you get stung by a bee? Well, okay, I take this back. I don't know if this is true or not. I'm going to make an assumption that if you get stung by a bee at work, that that's not workers' comp. It could be, so I don't know. Um, but you know, if it's okay. a beekeeping operation, possibly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like that commercial, the State Farm commercial. Um, so yes, so I imagine that would be a, a, a worker workers' comp claim. So allergic reactions. Um, the thought is that mandatory and most likely incent even incentivized vaccines will be workers' compensation issues. So now we're not talking about mandatory. Now we're not talking about voluntold-ish, we're getting into incentivized. So I give, now give you, as an employer, give you a bonus. So now, uh, you know, that's maybe considered coercion forced as part of your employment. So now you have potentially a workers' compensation issue. Um, workers' compensation policies have exclusions um, of covering basically covering the employer under certain circumstances. And so you have intentional torts, hidden dangers. So employer knew of a danger, did not tell the employee, employee gets hurt. The workers' comp policy is likely not going to kick in because the employer knows better. And so that's an exclusion. So you have these exclusivity issues. And so now you have to, okay, does the policy cover it? So now you need to look at your workers' policy, comp, workers' comp policy to see if it covers it, just so you know whether or not it's going to be covered. Um, one thing that you do not want to do, amongst many other things in this, in this uh, scenario, is do not encourage one vaccine over another. 
don't say, well, you know, hey, Moderna one's better than Johnson Johnson, even though I think there's, I don't know if this has been proven or not, that Johnson Johnson may not work as well against the Delta variant. I don't know. Um, I did not get that one, so I'm okay, I think. But you know, there's also the theory that at some point in the next decade, we're all going to turn into zombies and it's going to be like that movie with uh, Will Smith in it um, and where he's the sole survivor. So hopefully maybe you're the lucky one that has um, whatever DNA to, to avoid becoming a, a zombie. Um, then you get into, okay, have an employment contract situation. And, uh, you know, it's, and that will, even though it's an employment contract, it's at will. So I can fire you for whatever I want to fire you for, essentially. So you get into the discrimination issues and those kind of things. But what that does is, is that brings up two kind of sub issues. The first is that um, what does your employee manual say with respect to things like this? It probably doesn't. Uh, and so you may want to look into appropriately writing your policy employee policy manuals handbooks to deal with situations like this so at least you have the ammunition you're still going to get accused of being discriminatory in most cases but at least you have that okay on notice that this was part of the requirements of the job you knew this was the requirements of the job prior to you accepting employment you accepted employment knowing that this was a requirement kind of makes it a little harder to say well i'm not going to get the shot and that's discriminatory it's like well no we're a private company, we can set up our policies and procedures. Um, uh, and also makes you think about what reasonable accommodations, like let's say if someone, you know, in a current employee doesn't want to get it. So it kind of gets, you know, the, the creative flowing a little bit. Um, okay, what else should employees consider when deciding on a vaccination policy? And th these are non-legal issues, some of these, right? Okay, asking employees to choose between a vaccine and their job could affect morale. Um, you know, there were already problems with getting people to wear masks, and now you're asking them to do something a little more severe and significant. So um, statistically, only 48 to 58% of employees have indicated that they would be willing to take the vaccine when available. Now that number may be different now. I think this, this information is probably maybe six weeks old or so. Um, okay, what do you do, practically speaking, if a lot of your workers and a lot of the good ones refuse? What are you gonna do? Are you gonna fire them? Are you gonna make an exception for them and not make an exception for others? Are you gonna fire that person and then decide that you are not going to be as strict? So have you discriminated unintentionally, meaning the discriminatory, the discrimination comes in the effects or the behavior after the initial action versus at that time that you are making the decision. So it's, you know, is it a cause or is it an effect kind of thing? So I've, I've been throwing a lot at you and there's a lot more that I could, but they're actually in this, uh, this outline. The last section is what should employers be doing now? So I'm going to share this with you. And again, not legal advice, just friendly suggestions because, and, and I know I say that often, but in this, especially in this environment, um, when you're dealing with it and on a case by case basis, and there are so many variables and factors in relation to that individual's health coming into this scenario, the, all the factors that we talked about, the environment, the workplace, the other workers, the what do you do what type, type of job it is that these are very high level recommendations that you know what, what essentially i'm saying is, is if you do it looks like there's maybe 10 bullet points here you do all these 10 bullet points it doesn't make you immune to prosecution for doing and i say prosecution immune from liability for not doing it properly so these are suggestions determine business need for mandatory vaccinations some of this is kind of like, okay, well, duh, but I'm going to say it anyway. Determine if required for all employees or only certain groups. Document business reason and policy. Consider incentive versus mandatory. So, you know, does that mean bonuses? Does it mean extra PTO? Does it mean gift cards? You know, what, what is the extent of the incentive? Uh, voluntary. Um, making it voluntary doesn't fix all of your issues. 
you still have potential, as we said, workers' comp issues, uh, compensation and leave issues. You need to have a uniform message and process. Don't make it up on the fly. And um, if you do, or the policy that you implement, be very mindful of making changes or exceptions. Sometimes this will come up with um, your more favored employees. Perhaps it's your brother or brother-in-law or a sibling or a child or a niece or nephew. So you need to be careful because you know, discrimination doesn't get an exception for family members. The trained supervisors on vaccination issues, again, to have a unified message going out there. So everyone's saying the same thing, doing the same thing. Trainer reminds supervisor, supervisors duty to accommodate, report to HR, et cetera. So remind them of their duties. They can't just say, well, not my problem, okay? With someone who is in a managerial position has certain duties implied to them with respect to the employees that are under them. Um, prepare message to customers in the public as to the vaccination policy and program so that people know what you're doing, you know? And, and it's more so, it's a public relations thing to say, hey, look at us, we're doing all the good things. But it's also, if someone doesn't feel, com if someone reads, this is what we're doing, and they're like, oh, so they're not requiring them to wear masks, maybe I don't wanna go in there. So it's, it's a CYA kind of thing for you as well to say, okay, you knew what we, you were informed, you were provided notice as to what we are doing, therefore what we are not doing, but yet you walk through our front door anyway. So, you know, don't come back and tell us that we got you sick and we should have been all wearing masks. Now, there's a, a sub issue with that is that you need to do what you say you're going to do. And even like this morning, getting a, uh, a beverage, be breakfast beverage, I know that the requirements of this particular um, restaurant is that all workers should be wearing masks. And I look around, some of them have it around their neck, some of them have it on their chin, some of them have it on their mouth, but not over their nose, you know? And um, I was watching carefully who was making my stuff just to make sure that, you know, this, that's just my own personal preference. But, you know, am I gonna now use the mobile app to order from there or am I gonna go and make sure that people are wearing masks? But, and if I do accept the food and the beverage, to, at that, for me at that point, I, the risk is on me because I've accepted to do that. You know, I could have said, yeah, give me my money back. I'm not eating that stuff or drinking that stuff. So, and then um, uh, multi-state employers, something to consider if you, you know, as I said, a lot of this is state law. Yeah, some of it's federal, a lot of it is state law. So if you're in different states, if you're operating businesses in different states, you need to be mindful that there may be differences and differentials between your requirements mandated with respect to, um, uh, discrimination, um, you know, the, the bad stuff, but also what you might be required to do moving forward with respect to that. And also, you know, what enforcement is, is occurring with respect to the respective state attorney generals and things like that. So that was a lot of information that I unpacked for you guys, but it's only, there's still a lot of stuff, stuff in the box, but um, I think that I probably have fried people's brains long enough at this point on this stuff, but hopefully, you know, the, just even going topically over this stuff is helpful to at least be aware of the hoops that you have to jump through um, and, you know, some of the requirements and, and really what is at the forefront. As I said, it seems to be um, medical conditions and religious um, rel religious objections to getting the vaccination. So um, a question that came in on the chat, probably because he would love to have a link put into the chat for participants from David was, could we get a link to that decision and analysis that was done kind of in the first, probably third of your um, unpacking? Um, and he wanted to hear, just have a reiteration of what court that uh, case was in. There was, it was after the, uh, if I remember right, it was after the, the situation with the, uh, the hospital group and it was the next scenario, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, uh, it was, um, let's see if I can find that. Uh, New Mexico, you're talking about the county detention center? Um, yeah, I think so, because there was kind of a checklist that, oh, yeah. it's the main hospital group is what he was talking about. Oh, that, that one is in, um, so it's an order on dismissal, so it's very short. It doesn't have essentially the entire opinion. This was affirming the opinion. It's the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas. Um, this was pulled from the internal docketing system, so I can, I don't have a link to that. It was provided a PDF of this, but if it may be publicly available, it's Jennifer Bridges, like bridge with an S, is the main plaintiff, and it was against Houston Methodist Hospital. And the judgment was entered, order was entered on June 12, 2021. Can you reiterate the one in New Mexico too? Because there was kind of a decision tree in that one, I think. Yep. Um, okay, New Mexico is Legareta, L-E-G-A-R-E-T-T-A versus Macias, M-A-C-I-A-S. Um, the District of Northern Mexico filed February 28, 2021. And that's all the information that I have in this outline that one of my partners gave to me. So right, cool. David, if you want more information, just send me an email if you're not able to find that and I'll um, get one of our summer clerks to pull the cases and send them to you. Yeah, I mean, is your general take Jack that the legal rulings seem to favor more you know, look, you can go always go find another job if you don't like our policy. Um, just generally speaking. That, that seems the way, you know, it's, it's capitalism, it's private enterprise. So putting aside government agencies for a moment that yes, with private businesses, um, but even with private businesses, they're required to provide reasonable accommodations. Um, and so what we've done is we've essentially taken the standards that already exist and adding another, um, another, uh, you know, incident of what, when you have to provide reasonable accommodations for a worker who refuses to take the vaccine, but not every refusal, it has to be for, um, you know, either a medical issue or a religious issue. Um, but then you get into the, okay, well, what we talked about towards the end is have a uniform policy because you don't want to be accused of discrimination on all the other things, whether it's race, gender, preference, whatever it is. So, you know, set it out, enforce it, keep it consistent, um, and then deal with the exceptions as we've talked about. Right. Well, Having Jack on this line is kind of like um, instead of Cliff's notes, it's Jack's notes, and uh, which is good because you're going through a bunch of legalese that I would kind of put in the gobbledygook. At least that's what happens in my brain with it. <laughs> and, and I appreciate that, Jack. Thank you for boiling it down and not making us read 25 pages of seven point legalese type. Well, actually, uh, part of it's cool. to my benefit, too, because if I get it out during the day, I don't take it home at night and I talk like a regular human being instead of like a lawyer. <laughs> so, so your wife and children are happy about that. That's a good yes. thing. So <laughs> uh, any questions out there uh, that can be related to this or not? And while you're thinking about that, um, I uh, have been conversing back and forth last night and this morning with Matt Linville of Bankers 1031. He's uh, their group that um, has expertise in 1031 exchanges. And I had a really interesting call with him yesterday talking about the fact that they have more activity than ever. It's historic actually at this moment. And I said, what's happening with the speculation of, you know, Biden tax plan implications, et cetera. And, and uh, he had plenty to say about that. Like, you know, there's still a lot of ambiguity and there's a lot of what if scenarios going on with that. So I think what we're going to do is next week, unless something else 
really earth shattering happens between now and then. Uh, I think we'll have Matt Linville with Bankers 1031 join us. And uh, so it, because we've got a lot of clients that are either in commercial real estate or they own real estate uh, as kind of side things, or they own commercial real estate as a part of the, the ownership of the company, blah, blah, blah. So uh, it seems to be another hot topic. So um, we'll go deeper into that next week unless things change, but Matt Linville will be joining us at least right now. That's what the plan is. Adam or Jack, anything else that you guys have on your mind? Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, here's, here's an interesting thought. Can you imagine if a staffing company requires a vaccine, but the companies they send staff to don't? I think that would cause any problems. It's funny that that, that was brought up um, because it has come up. And it's come up from two different directions. So it is, is it, is it a business opportunity to say, hey, look, all of our temporary staff people are fully vaccinated and we offer that to you. And then you're right. Now you're throwing these people into potentially a vat of unvaccinated people. So you have that potential issue with your own employees as the owner of the staffing company you have issues of, okay, well, you know, on the other end of things. So, you know, the question is, is it discriminatory to in the contract between the staffing company and the, the client, the customer to require that all of the customer's employees be vaccinated? And then is there an indemnification that goes back to the staffing company and, and essentially to that staff person if they get sick or if they even brought the illness home, you know, so now you have, uh, I guess, recently found out that, you know, even if you're vaccinated, you could still be a carrier of COVID and, and the Delta variant in particular. So yes, a lot of issues come up with that, but, you know, being on the entrepreneurial side of things, is that a business opportunity to say, Hey, look, and, and then, the next layer of that is requiring the staffing company, requiring its own employees to have the vaccination in the first place. Right. So the, all the things we just talked about for the past, you know, 50 minutes or so, a lot of it, you know, comes into play too. So you can see how this is just a, a huge domino effect and it, it's um, it goes in both, both directions. It's like, okay, it's not just individual to employer, it's employer to individual and vice versa. And then you introduce third parties customers into the mix and then yes absolutely so you know i i'm i'm uh wishing our litigation groups well into 2022 because they think they're busy now they're going to be very busy next year dealing with all this stuff ah so um Anything on the status of the new SBA portal for PPP forgiveness? Any news or insights into that? Um, I don't have any on that one. Yeah, I, I have heard mixed reports that it was up and then it was down. And I don't know if it was up and then broke or they took it down or I don't know anybody who has been able to, to utilize that or receive information from it. So I think it's still a, an unkept promise as far as full activation, but I, you know, I haven't had a chance to look at that as of this morning. So, cool. Um, well, lots of really good information that you know, if somebody was paying Jack for advice, even though nobody was paying for it, and this was not advice, legal advice. So it would have cost a lot of money. <laughs> so um, hopefully this has provided value. We're going to keep doing this as long as it does provide value. Um, can always count on typically David and, and Jack. <laughs> I mean, uh, Robert. <laughs> Jack to, to give good advice, same way with Adam, but David and, and uh, Robert to provide great questions. 
So um, before we sign off, any other last minute questions or topics that you guys want to make sure that we're covering that we haven't covered yet or you, that we need to go deeper on, let us know. Uh, we will put this thing up on the BGW CPA YouTube channel later on this afternoon. Somebody came on late. Um, David, it's great to have you. Thank you. Um, it was good to hear from a good movie from the past with Robin Williams. <laughs> That's like one of my favorite things from that whole movie is just that. Oh my goodness. Uh, so that, that any, part in the acronyms, right? All the acronyms that he throws out. Yeah. That is, I think one of the best scenes ever in any movie where he just, and he, he probably just made it up on the spot. I mean, probably. So he was, he was a brilliant light. Uh, too bad that he's no longer with us. But uh, anyway, um, any last minute dad jokes that you've got? You, you know, you're probably you know, exhausted after that diatribe. I don't know. I brought, oh I brought one just in case you asked. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, people. <laughs> All right. This one's stupid, silly. All right. Why are skeletons so calm? Ah, uh, you got me. Because nothing gets under their skin. Oh. oh come on. Uh, that one, that one sort of just a little laugh. A little. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm with you on that one, David. That's a, that's a groan. But I asked for it. So uh, <laughs> Jack delivered. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, hey, next week, 73 weeks. So um, we appreciate that. Adam, it's always great to see you, even if it's virtually. I enjoy it. Same way with you, Jack. Beautiful skyline. It's still under construction. That's right. Yep. Yeah, it's always under construction. That's a good and thing. I, and I did stuff. not fall last week, so I'm okay. I'm yeah. glad. Yeah. Really glad about that. All right. Well, we'll look forward to next week and going into a deep dive in 1031 exchange unless something else really crazy happens. But uh, it'll be fun to have another person on here with some expertise. So have a great rest of the week, y'all. Thank you, guys. See y'all. Bye-bye.